wonders, historical background. When studying a subject matter, such as rightly dividing the word of truth, commonly referred to as dispensationalism, there is a tendency on the part of the Bible student to merely seek for answers to specific problems. This is fine so long as one always considers the foundational principles concerning the overall subject matter. One rather problematic area involves the study of the sign gifts found within Scripture. If you purchase this book or received it as a gift because you wanted to know or were told you needed to know what the Bible says about tongues, healing, words of knowledge, etc., you may be tempted to read this chapter first in search of those answers. While you may be fortunate to find the answers you seek, the likelihood of mastering this chapter without first grasping the foundational elements presented in the previous chapters is rather unlikely. In fact, without the foundational material presented in the earlier chapters, you might even reject the truths presented, citing the complicated nature of understanding the ebb and flow found within Scripture. The fact is, there are many saved and unsaved in the world today who are confused as to what they believe about the involvement of current supernatural signs. Some people are just curious and may never have personally witnessed anyone speaking in tongues, quote-unquote, or claiming a televangelist type of healing. Yet far too many hesitate to question these matters because of how television has portrayed these so-called supernatural phenomenon. After all, the Bible contains historical evidences for those types of things taking place. Additionally, some believers have family members whom they love and respect who firmly believe the sign gifts are a prominent aspect of New Testament Christianity today. Because of this very real conflict, there exists a desire not to contradict loved ones so adamant in their experiences. Others are battling certain diseases or infirmities and fear that any perceived faithlessness will cause them to remain in their undesirable conditions. Rest assured of this one thing, regardless of the changed circumstances and healing today, God still heals. Truthfully, only the Lord fully deserves our allegiance. Furthermore, we honor others most when we honor God first and foremost. Therefore, it is not most important that we agree with friends, loved ones, family members, respected Bible teachers, preachers, churches, Bible college, or denominations, but that we agree with the God of the Bible. We must put aside all feelings, expectations, and apprehensions and approach every study of the Bible with an open mind. Clarity of Purpose the purpose of this study is not intended to deny the supernatural involvement of God in the universe today. Quite the contrary. In fact, one stands in awe when considering the involvement of Jesus Christ and upholding all things by the word of his power, Hebrews 1.3, and God in whom we live and move and have our being, Acts 17.28. Man's very existence depends upon, manifests itself only through the miraculous, yet there is much more. Each saved person has experienced the miracle of a new birth. When God found us, we were dead in trespasses and sins, and he quickened every believer, made us alive, Ephesians 2, 1. In other words, because of salvation, we have passed from death unto life, 1 John three fourteen. Is not this one of the most miraculous phenomena of all? Our purpose in this work is to focus upon the specific use of signs and wonders used by God to confirm the Word of God for those who live in doubt and unbelief. By studying the Bible rightly divided, it is easy to pinpoint and explain the presence and manifestation of sign gifts in history during times when those gifts escalated and during the times when they diminished. This is especially important when one considers the stern warnings given to Christians today against walking by sight. In fact, before examining the scriptural patterns and variations of the sign gifts, it is important to recognize the emphasis placed upon living by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. On page 365, the chart is titled, Walk by Faith and Not by Sight. According to modern dictionaries, faith is unquestioning belief that does not require proof or evidence. Webster's New World Dictionary. However, this definition falls far short of defining faith according to the scriptures. Faith is not the opposite of fact, the lack of scientific type evidences. The evidences of faith may operate differently than the evidence for science, but evidences for faith do exist. When defining faith, many people focus upon Hebrews 11.1 as the single definition and ultimate understanding of faith. 
This unfortunately severely hampers the complete understanding. However, grasping the truth conveyed by this verse serves as the prerequisite for understanding faith. A simple definition for faith involves taking God at his word. This type of biblical faith rejects information when that information tends to thwart the words of truth found in God's word, no matter the level of perceived credibility. Our faith is to be placed in God alone, but we can only properly know how to believe God through his word. That is what Paul meant when he wrote, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10:17. True biblical faith does not involve an unquestioning belief that biblical faith lacks proof or evidence. Faith accepts God's word, his promises, and his warnings as fact and responds accordingly. Since there are many evidences that the word of God is true, faith does not involve some type of blind leap of faith. It is rather an intelligent, holy reaction to the wondrous words of God. Faith, defined in a broader sense, serves as one link in a chain attached together with other links. Faith follows the hearing of the word and is founded upon the word, yet functions through works. Biblical faith is not a mystical belief in God and his principles, nor is it based upon inner knowledge, personal revelations, or mere human reasoning. Additionally, it is not a leap into the dark. Biblical faith firmly stands upon the words of Almighty God. Ultimately, when Romans 10.17 is more fully extrapolated, it teaches that faith comes by the word of God, whether expressed audibly in the past or conveyed to man through God's written word in the present and future. So-called blind faith is unscriptural. No such thing exists because we are told to try the spirits, 1 John 4.1, not blindly walk through life. Having established these basic guidelines concerning faith, everyone should recognize that personal faith and the requiring of signs are incompatible. The more people become dependent upon signs, the less they exercise faith. In other words, faith eliminates the need for signs and the confirmation those signs provide. Pause for a moment and think about it. Signs offer confirmation by sight, but faith is the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Considering God's feelings about faith is equally enlightening. The Bible points out that without faith it is impossible to please Him. That is God, Hebrews 11.6. Those looking for confirmation through signs simply cannot please God because God expects man to faithfully trust Him without requiring proof to do so. Where it all began. A sign is an identifying gesture, mark, or token intended to communicate a specific message. The first chapter of Genesis contains the first use of the word sign in any of its various forms, Genesis 1.14. This first usage also explains the fourfold purpose of the lights in the firmament. The lights were number one for signs, number two for seasons, number three for days, and number four for years. Three of these purposes involve the progression of time, seasons, days, and years. But the most intriguing element for our present study involves the use of the heavenly lights for signs. This may not seem important to today's high-tech society, but imagine a world before the Bible and even before Moses wrote the Pentateuch. We are told that in that world God placed lights in the heaven to testify of himself. This manner of communication from God became especially prominent among the heathen or Gentile people groups, Jeremiah 10.2. This act of God showed God's gracious nature by putting it on full display for man to witness. Eventually, the Jewish people became familiar with the revelation of God through his word, but the Gentile world remained ignorant of God's revelation because they did not have his written word. When God created the world, he put lights in the heavens for a purpose. Their mere existence would testify of his character and nature. David declared this truth in Psalm 19.1 when he said, The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show with his handiwork. God used signs in the constellations to communicate to his creation. Yet we caution the reader not to be fooled into thinking that this so-called blood moon fiasco so prevalent in the recent past was ordained of God. The moon never turned into blood, Acts 2.20. The signs, the light's existence, offer enough information for the heathen to know there is a creator. After all, the obvious limitation of this type of revelation is that it only reveals the basic information concerning his eternal power and Godhead. Romans 1.20 For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
Because God's creation proves the existence of a divine creator, man cannot claim ignorance. The Bible says man is without excuse. Through God's creation, all those desiring to recognize that there is a God are given the opportunity to see even his eternal and divine nature. Creation testifies to the greatness of God and to the greatness of his work. In fact, the heavens reveal the wonders of God's glory and the splendor of his work, even crossing every language barrier. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Again, these heavenly signs were intended to offer to man the knowledge of a holy God. This phenomenon was true in the beginning for all earth's inhabitants, but continued to be true, especially among people, groups lacking a written revelation of God. This may be why Paul again broached this subject in one of his earliest epistles as the door to the Gentiles swung open. The reason God provided these initial signs was to serve as a testimony of the divine character of God. The historical record bears witness to this phenomenon. God has given witness of these truths through the testimony of foreign missionaries. Often when a missionary arrived in a pagan land, he learned that the local population believed in a God simply because of creation. Their conscience drove them to pray for more light that would ultimately come from a personal knowledge and fellowship with that God. Thus the missionary answered that call, Acts 16, 9 and 10. It matters not how remote the civilization. Signs confirming the Exodus. Exodus chapter 4 contains the second use of the word sign as pertaining to our present study. This occurrence serves the most enlightening for establishing a solid foundation in this study. It proves crucial to an understanding of God's intended use of sign gifts. In this instance, the Bible connects three companion characteristics, the spoken word of God, unbelief, and the Jewish people. These three elements combined are important because understanding how signs began helps to determine why God used them for a witness of himself. The truth about sign gifts starts with Moses. When Moses was 40 years old, it came into his, that is Moses' heart, to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, Acts 7.23. According to the Bible, Moses supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not, Acts 7.25. To fulfill what he thought was God's plan, Moses took matters into his own hands by killing an Egyptian. Regardless of his attempt to help his brethren, they rejected him. As a result, Moses fled and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons, Acts 7.29. When forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush, Acts 7.30. When God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, God testified that he had seen Israel's affliction while in Egypt and was come down to deliver them, Exodus 3, 7 and 8. Although Moses was God's chosen deliverer, the deliverance was to be accomplished by God's power and presence. In fact, this was the gist of God's message. I have surely seen the affliction of my people, Exodus 3, 7. I have heard their cry, Exodus 3, 7. I know their sorrows, Exodus 3, 7. I am come down to deliver them, Exodus 3, 8. I am come down to bring them up out of that land, Exodus 3, 8. The cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, Exodus 3, 9. I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them, Exodus 3, 9. The emphasis shows that the interaction was all about God. From these seven God-sent pronouncements, Moses seemed to focus upon only the statement pointing to Moses' involvement. I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt, Exodus 3.10. As soon as Moses heard those words, his mind likely raced back four decades earlier when he had tried in his own power to deliver Israel but failed miserably. In Moses' unbelief, he responded, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Exodus 3.11. God responded to Moses' concerns by emphasizing God's power and presence as the source of deliverance. He said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Exodus 3.12. You would think that a man hearing audibly from the Lord would simply respond in complete faith. 
Yet Moses again questioned the Lord and said, When I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Exodus 3.13 God intended for the focus to be on the I am and not the man Moses. God communicated with this faithless and unbelieving servant as he sought to again turn the focus upon himself and away from Moses. I am that I am, he said. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Exodus 3.14 The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Exodus 3.15 Tell the elders, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt, Exodus 3.16. Tell them this too. I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto a land flowing with milk and honey, Exodus 3.17. One would think that this should have sufficiently convinced Moses, but God provided some additional details. God proceeded to give Moses the details concerning how each party would respond to Moses' message of deliverance. God said the Israelites would hearken to Moses' voice, and he and the elders would come to Pharaoh and declare God's call for their departure, Exodus 3.18. However, the king of Egypt would not let them go, and God would stretch out his hand in demonstration of his mighty wonders to judge Pharaoh and Egypt, Exodus 3.18-20. Afterwards, the Israelites would be favored in the sight of the Egyptians, would spoil them upon their departure, Exodus 3.21-22. and Moses responded in complete unbelief while standing before the burning bush, saying, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee, Exodus 4.1. Because of Moses' unbelief, this now leads to the point of the story within the context of this chapter. God gave three signs to Moses, an unbelieving Jew, to confirm the revelation given through God's spoken word. Number one, a rod became a serpent only to become a rod again, Exodus 4, 2 through 4. The second one, the hand of Moses became leprous only to then turn again the same as his other flesh, Exodus 4, 6 and 7. And then thirdly, the water turned into blood, Exodus 4, 9. You'll find the chart on page 371 titled, Signs Given to Moses. These signs confirmed God's spoken word to an unbelieving Moses. Each of these signs would again be repeated to convince the unbelieving Jews in Egypt's bondage to follow Moses, Exodus 4.5, 4, 4.8, and 4.9. Sadly, Moses compounded his faithlessness by again focusing upon himself. I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue, Exodus 4.10. Moses saw himself as completely inadequate to communicate God and his wonderful works to the Israelites. God himself reminded Moses that it was God who made man, and that it was he who would empower any man to accomplish his will, Exodus 4, 11, and 12. As a final demonstration of faithlessness, Moses said, Send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send, Exodus 4:13. It is very important to understand the signs performed by Moses in Pharaoh's presence were not done to convince Pharaoh of anything. Signs are always for Jews and no other people. Additionally, the signs Moses saw while standing before the burning bush were performed to confirm God's words to Moses, a Jew in unbelief. Unfortunately, signs, in particular these signs, began a vicious cycle for the Jews. However, one could argue that the cycle began before Moses' birth because the Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1.22. The signs from God allowed unbelieving Jews to walk by sight rather than being dependent upon faith. This is why the Bible's historical record reflects a plethora of Jewish signs but only specifically mentions faith twice in the Old Testament. The chart on page 372 shows the purpose of signs. God's prophetic words were all fulfilled. Initially, the people believed the words of Moses. The people believed, according to Exodus 4.31, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. Just as God had foretold, 
Pharaoh refused to let the people go, Exodus 5, verses 1 and 2. And Pharaoh made their burdens greater rather than releasing them from bondage, Exodus 3 through 14. Those who had earlier demonstrated some faith in the word of God after the confirmation by the initial signs now lost hope and searched for someone to blame. The Israelites blamed Moses, Exodus 5, 20 and 21, and Moses blamed the Lord, Exodus 5, 22 and 23. History repeats itself. The unbelieving Jews brought about the promise of another round of signs, Exodus 7, 3. This time the ten plagues. Interestingly, the Lord plainly stated that he hardened the heart of Pharaoh, that I might show these my signs before him, that is Pharaoh, Exodus 10, 1, and that ye, the unbelieving Israelites, may know how that I am the Lord, Exodus 10, 2. Plainly, the signs were performed before Pharaoh that the Jews would know the Lord. Confirming his purpose, the Lord later asked of the Israelites, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? Numbers 14.11. The chart on page 373 continues the previous chart of the purpose of the signs. When the Jews testified of God's deliverance and their departure from Egypt, signs seen always to be the focal point of their testimony. Deuteronomy 6.22 testified that the Lord showed signs and wonders upon Egypt before our eyes. Deuteronomy 7.19 echoed this sentiment. The great temptations and the signs whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out. Deuteronomy 26, 8 again resonated that the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with signs and with wonders. Joshua testified, the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, which did those great signs in our sight, Joshua 24, 17. Other prophets like Nehemiah, Nehemiah 9, 10, Asaph, Psalm 78, 43, and Jeremiah, Jeremiah 32, 21 also resonated the same sentiments. The evidence concerning the Jews' focus upon signs is voluminous. Signs were always intended for the Jews. Yet far too many Christians would rather ignore the facts, trust in their feelings, and vilify those willing to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15. A life surrendered to Christ, the opposite of the self-gratification derived from experiencing God through some type of so-called signs. The modern sign-seeking, feelings-driven churches are all about experiencing God. So many trust their experiences more than they trust anything else. They would rather believe what they experience than believe God's word. If one's feelings become the force driving one's spirituality, the result is eventually a wrecked life. In fact, the historic nature of these signs presents the pattern that condemns the modern sign-seeking, feelings-driven churches. The pattern unfolded. The book of Mark offers the key to further understanding the biblical pattern. They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Mark 16, 20. The Bible student must carefully receive the truth. Ex the Bible student must carefully receive the truths expressed by the words of God or miss the significance of this passage as it relates to our present study. While it is obvious from the passage that the purpose of signs was to confirm the word, what may not be as clear is that the signs were to confirm the word preached. In other words, the signs, both Old and New Testament, were always intended to confirm an unwritten revelation from the mouth of God. Do not miss this point, even if it means rereading this paragraph several times. When unbelieving Jews needed confirmation of God's spoken revelation, that confirmation was provided via signs. In other words, signs were only necessary when three elements simultaneously existed. One, a newly spoken revelation. Two, a heart of unbelief. And three, the Jewish people. No signs were ever given by God if any of these three elements were missing. Never. This means that it is a very dangerous habit to be looking for signs now that God's revelation is complete in the 66 books of the Bible. There is no newly spoken revelation. The pattern continues. As the biblical scenarios expand, the patterns become ever clearer. Additionally, any exceptions to the rules serve to simply reinforce the rule and not to contradict it. As Bible-believing Christians, we should be willing to put any of our theories through the test tube of Scripture to ensure their accurate interpretation. 
Is the pattern discussed above concerning the signs truly a pattern throughout the Old Testament and beyond or merely a few instances? Consider the following examples. When the Jews doubted Moses and Aaron's authority, the earth opened her mouth to swallow some of the rebels, Numbers 16.32. Fire came forth from the Lord to destroy others, Numbers 16.35. And Aaron's rod brought forth buds which bloomed in the blossoms and yielded almonds, Numbers 17.8. Later in the book of Judges, a doubt-ridden Gideon requested, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Judges 6.17 When Saul was informed of his new role as the first king of Israel, the prophet Samuel told him of signs that would come to pass. He further instructed Saul, Let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. 1 Samuel 10.7 Hezekiah asked that his life might be spared and requested a sign to show that his request had been granted, 2 Kings 20, verse 8. Even the announcement of the birth of Christ was a promised sign to Ahaz, although he did not live to see Christ's birth, Isaiah 7, 10 through 14. These are only a few of the many examples. The Old Testament is filled with signs, even when the word signs does not appear within the context. The surrounding circumstances within the narratives do vary, yet the three common denominators are always present and identifiable. The variables would include things like the geographic location, the nature of the sign, individuals seeing the sign, and the period in which the people lived. Again, the three common elements which show up are newly revealed information through the spoken word of God, unbelief or doubt amongst the sign's recipients, and always directed toward the Jewish people. The first of these is probably the most overlooked of the three. The first element focuses upon the spoken word of God rather than the recorded or written word. In fact, once the word of the Lord was recorded during any given period, there was no need for confirming signs. From that point forward, the scripture served as its own final complete confirmation. Considering the full ramifications, these factors prove to be quite informative for anyone truly looking for truth. The additional details which follow will prove quite enlightening, but only for those who are willing to reject error and magnify God's word above all else, Psalm 138.2. The next chapter explores these truths in far greater detail concerning the New Testament application. What is to be our practice concerning signs in the present age? Although this may be hard for some to accept, God's truth is always worthy of our submission. Lastly, one should consider how this affected the people living during the intertestamental period. The Old Testament was complete and no word was given until Christ. This period is commonly identified as the 400 years of silence. With no newly revealed truths through the spoken word of God, there would have also been no need for heaven-sent signs. Not only did Israel experience 400 years without hearing from the Lord, they lived 400 years without seeing a single sign confirming his word. This must have been devastating to those living at that time. While this may seem insignificant to those who trust in the written revelation today, it likely devastated a nation accustomed to sensing God through supernatural signs. This is the end of chapter 24. Chapter 25, Signs and Wonders, Are They for You? Author's Caution If you've read this book from the beginning, as we advise, you will notice the prominence of charts used to reinforce the truths taught. These charts are incorporated to help visualize truths that otherwise might seem less clear. The following chart with some modifications simply builds upon the already established truths in the previous chapters. As this chapter progresses, additional details are added to the charts. The chart on page 377 is titled, The Jews Require a Sign. The additions in the current chart include the period known as the 400 years of silence. Take note that no signs took place during this time. Furthermore, we have added the note, The Jews Require a Sign. The previous chapter shows that this element of the Jews requiring a sign traces the origin back to the book of Exodus, yet most Bible students recognize that it also continues into Paul's epistles. This chapter explains the necessity of learning these truths. Due to the highly controversial subject matter tackled in this section, 
Most readers might find this chapter of greatest interest. The author certainly recognized how polarizing this subject has been for several decades. One reader may be firmly entrenched in his bunker, believing that signs are a thing of the past only used by God for the Jews. Another reader finds himself in his own bunker with his proof that God is an unchanging God and therefore his signs continue to manifest themselves among believers today. We believe that God intended for truth to unify believers. Our prayer is that we do not further entrench either of the parties within their opposing belief systems. Our goal is to bring the two opposing sides together so that the truth of the scripture becomes preeminent. The fact is that both sides would and should agree with most of the truths conveyed in the previous chapter. Only now should some feel the tensions rising as certain dearly held beliefs come under biblical scrutiny. Laying the groundwork. The arrival of the New Testament times brought new revelation from God, along with the customary signs from the Jews confirming the messages and the messengers. When compared to the signs found throughout the Old Testament, the nature and magnitude of these signs substantially increased. Nonetheless, the New Testament continued the three common historical characteristics. Following 400 years void of new revelation from God, one would think the Jews would have longed for the truth of God and the corresponding signs that came with these new revelations. Luke chapter 1 records the story of a Jew receiving a newly spoken revelation confirmed by the gift of a sign. This event obviously took place prior to the earthly ministry of Christ. The sign was given to ensure that this unbelieving Jew would believe God's newly spoken message. The Jew was Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. It must be understood that he could not be certain about the verbal message received without some sort of sign from God. The details are given by Luke. While serving in the temple, Zacharias was met by an angel who said, Fear not, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. Thou shalt call his name John. Luke 1.13. Not only was Zacharias promised a son, but he was promised a son who would be great in the sight of the Lord and be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Luke 1.15. Furthermore, because of John's ministry, many of the children of Israel shall turn to the Lord their God. Luke 1.16. In fact, John would be responsible for turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Luke 1.17. It is obvious that Zacharias received this message in unbelief when he asked, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. Luke 1.18 In other words, Zacharias wanted to know what token or sign he would receive to help him believe the spoken revelation given by the angel. To overcome Zacharias' unbelief, Gabriel answered with a sign. He would be dumb and not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, Luke one twenty. The Bible also makes it clear that the sign from God was given to Zacharias, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season, Luke one twenty. Once again, and as always, a sign was given to a Jew because of unbelief. The chart on page 379 continues the chart from the previous chapter, The Purpose of Signs. The Ministry of Christ now we proceed forward in time about three decades after Zacharias. It is interesting to note that the four gospel books offer the most visible details of both the Lord's work and the devil's work. We will cover a few of Christ's signs and wonders, but certainly cannot chronicle all of them. The Bible records vast details of Christ's ministry, yet John stated that there are many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. John twenty one twenty five. No book can detail every event, but the examples explored herein should suffice to show that the same pattern for Jewish signs that began in the Old Testament resumed at the announcement of John's birth. It also continued throughout the three and a half years of Christ's recorded ministry and into the apostles' ministries before finally coming to an end. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a man sick of the palsy was brought to him for healing. As they carried the sick man to him, Jesus saw their faith and said to the man sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee, Mark 2, 5. Christ forgave the man's sins based on what he saw in the man's heart, not based upon the work of the men carrying him. This newly spoken revelation proved quite problematic for certain unbelieving scribes who reasoned in their hearts, 
Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Mark 2, 7. There's the unbelief. The scribes did not believe that Christ was God, and the Lord perceived their unbelief. Thus he followed up with his pronouncement of forgiveness with a visible sign and the reason for the sign, that they may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Mark 2, 10. He said to the sick man, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. Mark 2, 11. This miracle of healing was to reveal the spoken truth to unbelievers. The chart on page 380, purpose of the signs, is added to from the previous chart. The Bible abounds with one example followed by another confirming this pattern, but we will consider one of the most prominent families in Bethany, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They shared a close fellowship with Christ during his earthly ministry. One well-known story involves the death of Lazarus and the fact that Christ allowed his death to take place. Jesus stated that he could have arrived prior to Lazarus' death and healed him from his sickness. Instead of arriving earlier, Jesus chose to delay his arrival until after Lazarus was dead and buried several days. Jesus told his disciples on the way to Bethany that Lazarus was dead. Christ had delayed his coming to the intent ye may believe, John 11:15. Lazarus' death was intended to allow Christ to perform a miracle. When Jesus arrived, he was met with unbelief from Mary, Martha, and the Jews who were mourning for Lazarus. Jesus said to Martha, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? John 11:40. As the stone covering Lazarus' tomb was rolled from the opening, Jesus spoke to the Father, saying, I know that thou hearest me, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. John 11:42. The Bible clearly expresses the result of this miracle so that the others would believe. Many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him, John 11:45. The chart on page 381, the purpose of the signs, is continued from the previous chart. In addition to the signs already mentioned, Christ's earthly ministry contained many other signs from God. For instance, the announcement of the birth of Christ, shepherds in the field were told, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, Luke 2.11. In confirmation of the spoken word, the angel stated that this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, Luke 2.12. Without the written word, only a sign from God could confirm his word. Later, when Jesus was brought to the temple for his circumcision, Simeon prophesied of him, This child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Luke 2.34 On numerous occasions, the Lord confirmed that Christ's earthly ministry would be followed up by a sign typified by the prophet Jonas. This sign would be the only sign of his resurrection, John 2, 18 and 19, given to a wicked and adulterous generation seeking after signs, Matthew 12, 39, Matthew 16, 4. First foundational principle. Perhaps most importantly, two great foundational truths were set forth during the ministry of Christ that paved the way for the transitions that would follow after his ascension. First, Jesus began teaching the dangers, pitfalls, and sinfulness of sign-seeking. When certain of the scribes and Pharisees requested a sign of him, Jesus rebuked them, stating that an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, Matthew 12, 39. On another occasion, Jesus told the Pharisees and Sadducees, seeking a sign, that in a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, Matthew 16, 4. Jesus expressed how grieved he was with the generation in his day because of their need for signs. He sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Mark 8, 12. Christ's words and actions reveal how displeased he was with his sign-seeking generation. Those who witnessed the signs remain in a state of unbelief and yet continually sought signs that they would ultimately reject. Furthermore, Christ's ominous warnings against sign-seeking indicated a time of transition where man's seeking of signs would manifest wickedness, carnality, and even rebellion against the Word of God. Second foundational principle. Christ set forth a second foundational principle concerning the signs he established during his ministry. The apostolic signs would serve a temporary purpose to confirm newly revealed truths spoken by his apostles. Although times were different, involving a different message, 
the Exodus chapter 4 pattern remained constant. The prominent features during the implementation of these new signs during Christ's ministry included the presence of, number one, a newly revealed spoken word, two, man's unbelief, and three, the Jewish people. In fact, one of the most prominent passages used by those attempting to prove signs are for today instead confirms the pattern set forth in Scripture and highlighted throughout this work. Mark sixteen seventeen, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken of them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. This passage contains some of the Lord's final teachings to the apostles following the resurrection and occurring just prior to his ascension into heaven. The message of Mark chapter 16 served as a transition from Christ's ministry, following his physical departure, to that of the apostles. It is important to consider that this passage and its intended message offer a broad understanding of the sign gifts in the New Testament church. The timing of Mark chapter 16 is clear. The Lord Jesus Christ had been crucified, tasting death for every man, Hebrews 2.9, had gone into the lower parts of the earth, Ephesians 4.9, Acts 2.27 and 31, met the thief in paradise, Acts 23.43, and on the third day he was reunited with his body in the tomb, Mark 16.6. 6. The ascension to the Father would shortly follow, Mark 16.19 and Acts 1.9. The context clearly shows that the Lord was giving some final instructions to the apostles concerning how they were to carry forth the ministry following his departure. They were to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and baptize those who had believed, Mark 16, 15. He said that those who believe not shall be damned, Mark 16, 16. Imagine taking an unpopular message to unbelieving Jews with what many of them would consider mere words without substance or confirmation. The New Testament had not yet been penned. Like Moses, the eleven apostles wondered how they would convince the unbelieving Jews that the message they preached was in fact from God. In response to these reasonable concerns, God indicated that certain signs would follow them that believe. As a rule, these signs were not designed to convince the apostles, but rather the signs following the apostles were intended to convince their unbelieving audiences to become believers. In fact, these signs are so closely related to the apostles that they were elsewhere referred to as the signs of an apostle, 2 Corinthians 12.12. 12. The book of Mark clearly identifies what these apostolic signs were. Mark 16, 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. These signs were, number one, casting out devils. Number two, speaking with new tongues. Number three, taking up serpents. Number four, immunity to poison. And number five, healing. These New Testament signs understandably find their roots back in Exodus chapter 4 where Moses refused to believe God. He compounded the problem because he determined that the Israelites would reject God's message of deliverance. In turn, God gave Moses confirming signs for the spoken message received. The signs given to Moses merit special attention since the Exodus signs contain so many parallels to those mentioned in Mark chapter 16. For example, take note of the first sign granted to Moses and how closely it matches the sign of snake handling mentioned in Mark chapter 16. On page 385, the chart is titled, Apostolic Sign Gifts. It is evident that the signs given to the apostles were intended to parallel the signs given to Moses at the burning bush. For instance, the Mark chapter 16 sign gifts of healing and snake handling closely match two of the signs God provided to Moses at the burning bush. Moses was healed of leprosy, Exodus 4, 6, and 7, and when his rod turned into a serpent, he handled it, Exodus 4, 2 through 4. Additionally, direct correlations exist between the immunity from drinking a deadly poison in Mark and Moses turning the water into blood. However, God's purpose for giving the sign gifts serves the greatest link between Old and New Testament signs. In both the Old and New Testaments, the sign gifts were intended to confirm newly spoken revelation during each period. The previous chapter's discussion of Exodus chapter 4 covered these confirming signs in the Old Testament length, 
But Mark chapter 16 clearly reinforces this truth. Signs confirm God's spoken word. Mark 16, 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Signs were given by God to confirm his verbal word to man. Like Moses, the eleven apostles obediently went forth offering a message of hope and deliverance with signs accompanying their preaching. God designed the signs for confirming their message. Because these signs were so closely associated to the apostles, God led the apostle Paul to label them the signs of an apostle. These signs were directly tied to the timing of the apostolic ministry. 2 Corinthians 12:11. I am become a fool in glorying, ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. God intended for signs to confirm newly revealed truths when initially given to man through the spoken word. Therefore, apostolic signs in the New Testament, both practice and purpose, match the pattern set forth in Exodus chapter 4. The signs performed by Christ and the apostles were intended for a specific purpose and not to be some sort of spectacle or show. One spectacle not seen today is any one of these televangelists jet-setting multimillionaires clearing out a children's cancer ward. Additionally, the sign gifts had defined time constraints. Once the event or truth was recorded in Scripture, the confirmation of the truth reverted to the written word, thus the signs were no longer necessary. Interestingly, the same group receiving the verbal word of God along with confirming sign gifts was also given the responsibility of recording the written word of God. The early church received confirmation of the spoken word through various signs because they simply did not have the completed written word. The Signs of the Apostolic Ministry Ten days following Christ's final ascension, Jews from every nation under heaven, Acts 2.5, traveled to Jerusalem for Pentecost, Acts 2.1. This same day, the apostles were endued with power from heaven with signs accompanying their message. Although these Jews from every nation were bound together through Jewish heritage, language barriers limited the effectiveness of their message, Acts 2.8 and verse 11. How would the apostles communicate the newly revealed spoken word of God if it could not be understood by the recipients? God graciously gave the apostles the gift of tongues, enabling the message to spread to all. Acts 2.4 And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It is important to understand that these tongues were not some sort of gibberish, but rather the spoken languages native to the Jews present from every nation. These apostles had never learned or spoken these languages, but God providentially and supernaturally enabled them to speak through this sign to the unbelieving Jews gathered on that day. The news of this miraculous event was noised abroad, and the multitude were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language, Acts 2, 6. In astonishment, the men asked, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Acts 2, 8? Furthermore, they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Acts 2.12. Ultimately, the gift of tongues was given solely to confirm the preached word concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 2.22-24. As Paul would later state, tongues are for a sign to them that believe not. 1 Corinthians 14.22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. The chart on page 387 is titled The Purpose of Signs, again continuing the previous chart. God used the gift of tongues as a sign to reach unbelieving Jews. All those who approached Scripture with an honest and sincere heart recognized that the gift of tongues was given for a sign to unbelievers. This point cannot be overemphasized. It cannot be refuted. Again, the Old Testament pattern of signs confirming the newly revealed words of God continued throughout the New Testament. The purpose of tongues served as a sign to those unbelieving Jews from every nation. Understandably, seeking some form of signs, including tongues, is irreconcilable with a Christian commanded to walk by faith today. 2 Corinthians 5.7 
In fact, God never gave the promise of signs to the Gentiles or Christians today. The tongues always related to the unwritten word prior to it being penned. Additionally, God always used tongues to prove something to the Jew, confirming both the messenger's legitimacy and the message's validity. This does not mean that God never performed miracles and signs upon anyone other than the Jews. Yet in each of these cases, where the sign gifts happened to be a non-Jew, the purpose of the miracles, or signs, was to confirm the truth to the Jewish audience then present. In some cases, the Jews needed to be convinced that God was working among the Gentiles similarly to how he had worked among the Jews, Acts 10, 45, and 46. Peter's testimony at the council in Jerusalem attests to the fact that he understood this truth, Acts 15:11. Unfortunately, the Jews became completely dependent upon proof or signs from God before they would believe God. God's interactions with the Jews concerning the use of signs for the Jews during the apostolic period did not vary from that under the Old Testament economy. Since the time of Moses, the Jews simply became accustomed to signs and required those signs to believe God and his messengers. 1 Corinthians one twenty two. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. Understandably, God's arch enemy perverts every good thing from God. Because God used tongues to prove to the Jews that he was the author of the truth being spoken, the great imitators created his own system of imitating God's works. Fortunately, God anticipated the satanic deception and abuse of the supernatural. For this reason, he established biblical rules for usage of the sign gifts and always worked within his own established parameters. This abuse should come as no surprise since tongues were a sign to them that believed not, 1 Corinthians 14.22. God never intended for them to be used as a sign for a spirit-filled, Christ-honoring, obedient child of God. This includes all the televangelists who seek to use their false signs as a money-making gimmick to dupe their audiences. Satan uses his so-called signs and wonders, such as the modern tongues phenomenon, to draw attention away from glorifying God. His goal is to elevate man by exalting fleshly performances. The pawns being used by Satan, a constant stream of them found on television, are simply drawing attention to themselves and away from God and away from the truths of the Bible. An individual convinced by Satan that he or she has any such gift can be more easily manipulated through further deception. The experience trumps the truth of God's word. The devil deceives both those with this quote-unquote gift and those they influence through the supposed miracles. For this reason, God warned us to try the spirits to determine whether they are in fact from God. 1 John 4, 1 Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out in the world. In addition to the apostolic gift of tongues, the Lord used other supernatural gifts to confirm his word during the embryonic church period. One of these other gifts was that of healing. These signs were not haphazard and without a deeper purpose. They were given for the confirmation of the word. Interestingly, there were instances when the sign gifts preceded the preached word. In Acts chapter 3, the healing of the lame man offers one such example. As Peter and John entered the temple, a certain lame man asked alms of them, Acts 3, 2. Citing that they had no silver or gold to offer the man, and without a message currently being preached, Peter said instead, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, Acts 3, 6. We find out later that this supernatural sign was not simply for the lame man. The healed man later grabbed the attention of the unbelieving Jews, Acts 3.10, and confirmed Peter's preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 3.12-26. In this case, the preaching came much later as the supernatural sign confirmed the preaching of Peter. Page 389 has the chart, the purpose of the signs, that continues to be added to. Amazingly, the apostles' power pertaining to the gift of healing was not limited to those with whom they came into direct contact. For instance, in Acts chapter 5, Peter's shadow could pass over a person, and that person could be healed, whether sick or possessed. Furthermore, contrary to the modern healing movement, every sick or possessed person was healed. This was true if they simply contacted Peter's shadow, and it was not contingent upon the individual's faith as most of the bogus faith healers claim today. 
Acts 5.15, Inasmuch as they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about into Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. The next example from Acts chapter 10 may initially appear to be an exception to the rule, but a careful reading shows that it too fits the scriptural pattern. Most Bible students recognize that Acts chapter 10 introduces the outreach to the Gentiles as this evangelization gradually became more prominent. Yet the Jews, including even the apostles, had ingrained prejudices toward Gentiles that caused apprehension. God summoned Peter and finally convinced him to go to minister to some Gentiles. When he arrived, he preached the death, burial, and resurrection to Cornelius and the other Gentiles gathered in his home. Acts 10.39 And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Peter's message was interrupted by a supernatural change that took place within the hearts of the Gentiles. The proof that the Gentiles acted upon the gospel that Peter preached was evidenced by what happened next. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Acts 10.44 How did these Jews know that God saved these Gentiles? The passage continues by stating that the gift of the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the Gentiles, evidenced by the speaking in tongues. Notice that the Bible says that the circumcision were astonished, Acts 10.45, and they of the circumcision, the Jews, which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they, the Jews, heard them, the Gentiles, speak with tongues and magnify God. Peter and the Jewish believers with him had no means of confirming that the Gentiles had accepted Peter's message unless God confirmed their acceptance with a sign. That sign was the gift of the Holy Ghost, which was speaking in tongues. The Jews received the sign of Gentile conversion when they heard these Gentiles glorify God through understanding the spoken tongues. Acts 10.46 And they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. The Bible believer understands that salvation took place because nobody gets baptized until they have believed in order to be saved. Without a written word, the Gentiles would have had no understanding of baptism. And without the tongue-speaking sign, Peter would have had no confirmation of the internal change that had taken place in the hearts of these new believers. Do not miss this point because it helps illuminate the whole truth. Furthermore, the Jews during the first century had a difficult time believing that God's program had become so Gentile inclusive. These saved Jews that accompanied Peter were unbelieving concerning the potential blessings of God directed upon Gentiles. The Bible records their reaction as one of astonishment concerning the confirmation the Gentiles receiving the Holy Ghost. The Jews only understood and believed that God was now pouring out his spirit on the Gentiles because of the signs, the tongues. The sign performed upon the Gentiles for the sake of the Jews confirmed the truth. The Gentiles were now benefactors of God's fullest blessings as he had foretold they would be. The Jews understood what these Gentiles were saying in tongues because they recognized that they were magnifying God. Again, the tongues were not gibberish or some heavenly language. It was most likely the language of the Hebrews in this case. We know for sure that these Gentiles spoke in a tongue that could be understood by the Jews, Acts 2, 6. Thus, we have additional evidence that God performed this sign for the Jews. This is the end of chapter 25. Chapter 26, Signs and Wonders, What About Paul? The examples provided are only a few of the many recorded instances relating the events of the first century. Throughout the book of Acts, God granted signs and wonders. The final chapter of Acts records the last of these signs and involves the Apostle Paul. 
In fact, understanding God's use of signs in the ministry of the Apostle Paul puts together the pieces as they pertain to God's use of signs among Christians today. To grasp this, we must again explore the divisions within Paul's epistles. The chart on page 393 is titled, When the Signs Ended. Paul's epistles to the Corinthians, Thessalonians, and Romans were all written prior to Acts chapter 19. Galatians was most likely started prior to Paul's imprisonment in Rome and not sent until Paul arrived in Rome according to the postscript. Footnote number one, postscript, under the Galatians written from Rome. Studying Paul's Acts journeys and epistles prior to Acts chapter 28 and his imprisonment revolutionizes how one sees and understands God's use of signs and wonders. First missionary journey. Paul's first missionary journey is recorded from Acts chapter 13 4 to Acts 15 40. During that trip, the Lord gave Paul signs and wonders to reach unbelieving Jews with the intent of confirming the verbal word of God. Here are some examples. At Patphos, Paul smote an unbelieving Jew with blindness, Acts 13, 6-12. At Iconium, God gave Paul and those with him signs and wonders, Acts 14, 3. At Lystra, God gave the gift of healing when an impotent man stood upright, leaped, and walked, Acts 14, 8-18. Second Missionary Journey Paul's second missionary journey is recorded from Acts chapter 1540 to Acts 1823. The use of sign gifts continued as Paul journeyed and wrote the epistles to the Corinthians, Thessalonians, and Romans. During the time Paul was writing his epistles to the saints at Corinth, he had also cast an evil spirit out of a girl in Philippi, Acts 16, 16 through 22. In Paul's epistle to the Corinthian saints, he testified of the Jews' need for signs, 1 Corinthians 1, 22, and spoke positively of the word of knowledge, 1 Corinthians 12, 8, the gifts of healing, 1 Corinthians 12, 9, and diverse kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues in 1 Corinthians 12, 10. He encouraged the saints to covet earnestly the best gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, and laid out clear instructions for how tongues were to be used in the work of God, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 40. He acknowledged that the signs of an apostle were wrought among them, 2 Corinthians 12, 12. While Paul was in Corinth in Acts chapter 18, 1 through 18, he wrote to the Romans, for I would, for I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through mighty signs and wonders, Romans 15, 18 and 19. There are no coincidences in the Bible. Paul's only writings, praising, regulating, or even mentioning signs in the present tense were written during the second missionary journey. The more time that elapsed from the day of Pentecost, the more scripture was recorded, the less of a reliance there was upon signs and wonders to confirm the truths of God's spoken word. Third missionary journey. Paul's third missionary journey is recorded from Acts 18.23 to Acts 21.14. During this trip, the signs and wonders again played a vital role in the work of God. While at Ephesus, Paul found disciples who knew only the baptism of John and laid hands on them, Acts 19.5. As he did, the Holy Ghost came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied, Acts 19.6, confirming what had taken place. It was also here that handkerchiefs or aprons were taken from Paul's body to heal the sick and possessed, Acts 19.12. At the end of Paul's third missionary journey, despite repeated warnings, Paul traveled to Jerusalem. At the end of Paul's third missionary journey, despite repeated warnings, Paul traveled to Jerusalem. This trip to Jerusalem would ultimately lead to Paul's imprisonment in Rome in Acts chapter 28. As expected, the signs and wonders continued to diminish. However, prior to Paul reaching Rome, while shipwrecked on an island, a poisonous snake bit him. In the spirit of the sign gifts, the serpent's venom had no effect upon Paul. The barbarians, non-Jews, witnessed the snake bite and saw that it ultimately caused him no harm. Since these barbarians were not Jews, one might think that this sign would contradict the rule concerning signs being for the Jews. However, when considering each word of God, the truths become evident. This event did not contradict the truth at all because the supernatural outcome was certainly not for the non-Jews as we see later in the context. 
Acts 28, 4. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast in the fire and felt no harm. The apostle Paul surely had the signs of the apostles, which stated in Mark chapter 16 that they shall take up serpents. Yet why did this event occur at this time since the barbarians, non-Jews, were the only ones mentioned as witnessing this sign? The supernatural intervention likely occurred for Paul's sake and the word that he would speak throughout the remainder of his ministry. God wanted to confirm to Paul that he would continue to use him to minister to others. Although Paul was going to lose his personal liberties, God could still be trusted throughout the difficult ordeal. The sign was certainly not intended for the benefit of the barbarians, that is, Gentiles, based on their unscriptural reaction of saying that Paul was a god. Acts 28.6 Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their mind and said that he was a god. Certainly God did not purpose to use this sign to convince the heathen to think Paul was a god. These Gentiles reached that conclusion because they could not understand how someone could survive after being bitten by this poisonous creature. Instead, this was about God confirming the truth to the Apostle Paul. Additionally, God used the Apostle Paul to heal those sick with various diseases, Acts 28, 7 and 9. From the biblical record, we know that these were the last recorded instances of the sign gifts performed during the church age. The next signs and wonders to be performed will be those done by the Antichrist through the power of Satan. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The chart on page 396 is titled Supernatural Signs Ending. Paul's imprisonment marked a turning point in the dispensing of God's truth to the world. At the end of the book of Acts, Paul made the final declaration of the shift in focus to the Gentiles when he told the Jews as they blasphemed God, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. Acts 28.28 28. During Paul's initial Roman imprisonment, he would write the epistles to the saints at Ephesus, Colossae, and Philippi, along with a letter sent to Philemon. None of these letters mention anything about sign gifts being performed or even suggest that they could be performed by the saints in any of those locations. Some may argue that the signs ceased because of Paul's imprisonment, yet past imprisonments had previously been the ones that showed the greatest signs and miracles in the earliest days of the apostolic ministry. Acts 5.19, Acts 12.7, Acts 16.26. Something was changing. The Jews were a people who lived according to the motto, seeing is believing. The church is instructed to do just the opposite, not walk by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Historically, God granted signs and wonders to confirm his word to the Jews before the written word. Yet by the end of the book of Acts, it had become quite apparent that God's interactions with man were changing. The sign gifts were being phased out, and men everywhere, Jew or Gentile, were expected to accept Christ and walk in him by faith, void of supernatural physical manifestations. We have seen that Paul's prison epistles lack any mention of sign gifts indicating their unavailability. But God offers additional evidence. We will consider the sign or gift of healing as a representative example of the termination of the sign gifts. Hints of such a change can be found as early as Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians, one of Paul's missionary epistles. He wrote that he had prayed for God's personal healing, but was told to depend upon the grace of God to comfort him during what would turn into a lingering affliction. 2 Corinthians 12, 1-10 An even more pronounced example of the cessation of the sign gift of healing points to Paul's shifting terminology in the epistle to the believers at Philippi, one of Paul's prison epistles. This dialogue concerning the recovery of Epaphroditus, one of Paul's fellow laborers. Epaphroditus was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him. Philippians 2, 7. Those who believe there exists no change in the sign gifts should consider why Paul did not send Epaphroditus a handkerchief or an apron for healing. Did Paul lack the desire to help his friend, or were the apostolic signs coming to a close? The transition continues to become even clearer as early as Paul's second epistle to Corinth. We can see from this epistle that it was not God's will for all men everywhere in all circumstances to be healed, nor were the apostolic sign gifts at work. During Paul's initial Roman imprisonment, it was clear 
that although God still healed, it would not result from the laying on of the hands of the apostles or via their shadow or their handkerchiefs. Instead, healing would be a simple act of God's mercy. By the time Paul wrote his epistle to Timothy, he was prescribing medicinal helps, no doubt assisted by Luke, instead of promising or encouraging Timothy that healing would come via the apostolic gifts. 1 Timothy 5.23 Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Why would Paul advise Timothy to use medicinal means to regain his health if nothing had changed? The reason is obvious. Things had changed. God was no longer using healing as a sign for the Jews, and Timothy would need to rely solely upon God's mercy for any potential relief from his ailment. Although these transitions are evident, God still heals miraculously and answers prayer concerning one's health needs. God has healed in the past, he can heal in the present, and he will heal in the future. The only difference is that healing today no longer comes because of the apostolic sign gifts. Healing comes when the mercy of God works via the hands of a doctor, or through the power of modern medicine, or through the unseen hand of God with no human explanation as to what transpired. Simply put, God's healing today cannot be equated to the events recorded in the Bible during the apostolic age, and the greatest resource is faith in God. During Paul's Roman imprisonment, he was temporarily released. He journeyed to some of the churches to check upon the believers. Afterwards, he returned to Rome as a prisoner, where he would write his final epistle, this time to his son in the faith, Timothy. In this letter, Paul informed Timothy then he had to leave Trophimus and Miletum because he was sick. 2 Timothy 4.20 Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. The chart on page 399 is titled Supernatural Healing Ends. The book of Acts records Paul and Trophimus traveling together to Miletum on another of his journeys. See Acts 20 verse 4 and compare it with Acts 20 verse 15. However, this particular trip recorded in Acts is not when he left Trophimus behind sick. We know this because Acts chapter 21 mentions that people had seen Paul in the city with Trophimus after he had departed from Miletum, Acts 21, 29. Additionally, Timothy accompanied Paul on this journey, Acts 20, verse 4, and would have already been aware of Trophimus being left behind sick. Therefore, Paul's release from his initial Roman imprisonment reflected an inability to heal Trophimus and the need to leave him behind in Miletum due to his illness. The apostolic gift of healing was coming to the end of its course. Ceasing of all the signs. The truths already established proved that apostolic sign gifts, including tongues and healing, etc., were no longer operational somewhere around A.D. 66. We know this because there's no mention of the implementation of sign gifts following this time. Additionally, the evidence also suggests that God's mercy without the apostles' personal intervention was man's single hope for healing. Yet, there exists even more evidence because the Bible foretold the temporary nature of the apostolic signs. God gave the Jews an advantage using the signs. They existed only for that allotted time. The next passage points out that tongues would cease and supernatural knowledge would vanish away. 1 Corinthians 13, 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 clearly defines the point when all Jewish signs ceased. They ended when something perfect removed the need for signs to confirm the verbal word. The Bible uses the word perfect in a unique fashion. The Bible teaches repeatedly that the word perfect implies the maturation or completion of a person or thing. Second Chronicles 8 verse 16, Ephesians 4, 12 and 13, Colossians 4, 12, 1 Thessalonians 3, 10, James 1, 4. In fact, 1 Corinthians 13, 10 above clearly contrasts that which is perfect with that which is in part. On page 400, the chart is titled, Supernatural Healing Ends. Historically, two perfectings were working simultaneously to bring about the transition from sign gifts to total reliance upon faith. One of those, and likely the one that brought about the other, was the perfecting of Scripture. 
When Paul penned 1 Corinthians, only part of the revelation was available in written form. This means that the full revelation of God remained in part until after 66 books were completed. When that which is perfect had come, the completed canon of Scripture, this phenomenon ended the need for prophecies, tongues, apostolic healing, and supernatural knowledge. As we have seen from God's Word, God had provided each of these components to supernaturally impart and confirm His revelation. Once God's Word was perfected or completed, before the end of the first century, A.D. 100, God no longer wanted man to depend upon the temporary. When Paul wrote from Rome while in bonds, he sent epistles to the saints at Ephesus, Colossae, and Philippi, along with his personal letter to Philemon, his letter to the Hebrews, and two letters to his preacher boys, Titus and 1 Timothy. Later, John's writings completed the canon of Scripture. It is important to keep in mind that the sign gifts were initially given to confirm the spoken word. Once the scripture was recorded and distributed, there was no further need for that which God designed to simply be temporary. The scripture would serve as its own confirmation. We know for sure that all 66 books were completed by A.D. 100. Secondarily, there was the maturation or perfecting of the church. This is likely the truth conveyed by the Apostle Paul when he said, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. As the church matured, it put away childish things, sign gifts, and replaced them with lasting virtues, faith, hope, and especially charity. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I also am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Paul never praises Timothy, Titus, Philemon, the Hebrew believers, the Colossians, the Ephesians, or the Philippians for having the sign gifts, nor were they ever admonished to seek those gifts. Yet the virtues identified in 1 Corinthians 13.13 13 of faith, hope, and charity continue to be a point of emphasis from the Apostle's pen. Some teachers also recognize how the face-to-face -face likely points to a dual fulfillment as expressed in the cross-references of 2 John 1.12 and 3 John 1.13 and 14. To Ephesus he wrote, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, Ephesians 1, 15 through 18. To Colossae he wrote, Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, Colossians 1, 4 through 5. It is important to recognize that charity and not the sign gifts demonstrate the peak of Christianity. 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13, Colossians 3.14, 1 Peter 4.8, 2 Peter 1, 5-7. Contemporary Christianity and even Bible believers have certainly missed this point. The chart on page 402 is titled Faith, Hope, and Charity. The New Testament Christians seeking some sort of signs and wonders would do well to examine his heart's intent. For what purpose do you want these supernatural gifts? Is God's written word not sufficient for you? Are you aware that this type of faithlessness displeases God, Hebrews 11:6, so much so that he lumps such living with a wicked and adulterous generation, Matthew 16:4? Did you know that all the sign seeking identifies you with a carnal church at Corinth? 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and verses 3 and 4. Satan always perverts the things of God and has done a tremendous job in today's sign-seeking mentality. People trust their experience over trusting God, sometimes even being deceived into hell. False signs and wonders. The deceptive sign-seekers are heading in one general direction, preparing the world for the coming Antichrist. After God ceased using the sign gifts, Satan, the great imitator, knew that he could eventually convince a spiritually anemic church to do his bidding. Satan easily influences those who place a heavy emphasis upon what they see and what they feel. These folks tend to fall into one of two egregious errors. Number one, they have no understanding of how to apply Scripture to the intended and scriptural audiences. And number two, they reject any Bible teaching that contradicts their experiences. Satan has them exactly where he wants them, deceived. 
2 Thessalonians 2, 8, And then shall that wicked, that is the Antichrist, during Daniel's 70th week, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Satan incorporates all power and signs and lying wonders to deceive the masses. We cannot caution the reader enough concerning the danger of trusting in one's experience above what the Scripture teaches. For instance, many sign-seeking teachers claim that only God can perform miracles like healing. The Bible disproves this supposition, the great deceivers setting up the world for the grand deception. The beast in Revelation chapter 13 will receive a deadly wound, and yet he will be healed by someone other than God. Romans 13, 12, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. God will not be the one that heals the beast. This will be the deceptive work performed by the devil. The world will believe the lie and worship the beast because this miracle of healing will seem so convincing. This miracle will be followed by many others, including the use of tongues, Revelation 13, 7 and 8. Many people living during Daniel's 70th week will trust in their own wisdom and experiences over the written word of God. Unfortunately, people today are making the same mistakes and will help to usher in the time when Satan will have free reign to deceive, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. The Bible clearly points out where the charismatic confusion is heading. One might wonder why Satan would desire to convince the world that all these signs and wonders today are from God. The answer to these questions come from studying the end time truths found in Matthew chapter 24. First, the context. Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Obviously, Matthew chapter 24 refers to Daniel's 70th week, also known as the tribulation, following the rapture of the church. Earlier in the same chapter, the Lord Jesus Christ warned that during this period and leading up to it, there would be many deceivers and false prophets. Matthew 24, 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Matthew 24, 11, And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure in the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Churches that fail to submit to God's word are the easiest for Satan to deceive. Satan has been preparing the world for these last few sign-seeking generations by convincing churches to place their experience above the teachings of the word of God. This has always been Satan's modus operandi. For instance, most charismatic churches use Acts 2-3, which cites tongues like as of fire, as one of their symbols. Imagine what will happen to those conditioned with this thinking when the beast brings actual fire down from heaven. Revelation 13, 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. The leadership of tongue-speaking churches is taught that their heritage includes some kind of signs. It does not. The Bible is quite clear that it never did. Those under their teaching who remain unsaved through the rapture will be the easiest targets for the Antichrist to deceive. They will easily fall prey to Satan's lies and tactics since they lack understanding due to what they have been taught. The unsaved church members left behind at the rapture will be Satan's tool to influence others to believe the lies of the Antichrist. While Daniel's 70th week will be void of the Lord's church, it will be well represented by religions and churches. These false churches will be one medium set up now to deceive the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, seven. The things taught in this chapter are not the opinions and biases of men preying upon your ignorance to make merchandise of you. They are the plain and honest truths spoken in love as given in the word of God, Ephesians 4.15. We have not quoted men's opinions, church fathers, or non-biblical history. Instead, we have quoted 
God's word and made it the supreme and sole authority. Will you continue to believe a lie simply because you may find it inconvenient to believe the truth? There is no excuse for rejecting the truth, no matter how much you treasure some experience that contradicts the plain teaching of Scripture. This is the end of chapter 26.